everybody, it's Allie, and welcome to our Y&R chat for Sunday, April 1st, 2018. Oh yeah, there's more than one way to make a baby. <laughs> Come through, Hillary and Devon. Thank you. <laughs> ah, I was dying. I was dying. They decide to just do things the old-fashioned way, a.k.a. the fun way. <laughs> Take that, Lily and Kane. <laughs> oh, it was so juicy. It was so dynamic. It was so good. What a good way to end on a Friday note. I just love it. That's that's carried me through the entire weekend. Um, and you know what? I'm going to let Lily and Kane for this moment feel a little bit proud of themselves because they thought that they've accomplished. Lily and Kane think they're over here being righteous superheroes sent uh, from above to help save Devon from making this terrible life decision. So on the day of Hillary's insemination, they lock her in the Hamilton Winters office. They do not let her out. They're standing right outside the office door while Hillary's like banging on the door, pleading, begging with them, and they're just acting like they don't hear her, talking about their dinner reservations. Ah, oh my goodness, I tell you what, I was so pleased to see all of this. I was just most of all glad that this took the turn that it took, obviously. Like, the antics that Lily and Kane were pulling were relatively light. I was afraid that it was going to go dark. I did not want to see Lily and Kane do something on the level of, like, sperm switching and have Hillary end up pregnant with somebody else's child. So, you know what? This whole thing, Lily and Kane's scheme, got us to a place that I was happy to arrive at. <laughs> Ah, and it was, you know, it was good on a couple of levels because you have Hillary on the inside begging to get out saying, you know, Lily, you have children. Why can't I have children? I just want to go do this. This is what I want for my life. Why, why do you hate me so much that you won't let me do this? And, and Lily is just like, you know what? You, I, I have no problem with you being a mother. I just don't want you to be the mother to my brother's child. And there was this kind of funny moment where you think that maybe Hillary's plea got through to Lily and she's gonna have a change of heart and she almost goes to answer the door and then she just pulls her hand back. Nope, no thanks. Ah, I, I am not mad at Lily and Kane about it. Not one little bit. This is a soap opera. Everyone is justified. No one is justified. Daytime drama requires drama. It requires challenge. This was a l relatively lighthearted challenge that resulted in our, you know, our romantic couple finally coupling, finally coming together. Two people that want to be together finally actually being together even though who knows how long it'll last. It honestly was far more surprising to me from Lily's perspective that she wasn't thinking about how this was going to not only affect her relationship with her brother, but also her business, her brand new business. You don't think that there's going to be some repercussions there for what you just did? Lily just went forward with this and said, you know, damn the consequences. When Devon shows up, I mean, Hillary's been calling him and she's missing her fertility appointment, Devon finally shows up. He's looking at Lily and Kane like they're insane, which in reality, of course, they would be. <laughs> but he's looking at them like, I cannot believe you guys would do this. I imagine that he's going to be really far more upset about it next week, even though, I mean, it, it, it possibly will all work out on the, in the end. Devon 
ushers Hillary back to her hotel room where he's comforting her. She's really genuinely upset. This is something that she has wanted more than anything. Now she's got Devon to agree to it. It's the day of a dream coming true and she thinks that now she's missed her window of opportunity to make it happen, her fertility window. Today was her peak fertility day, so she's now missed the opportunity to do something for herself and for her life and to, in her mind, you know, make, make her life better and make someone else's life better. And Devon is really trying to comfort her. <laughs> It turns out that Devon is the actual superhero here. He is ready to ride in and save the day, <laughs> suggesting that they just go ahead and do the naughty right then and there to make this baby. <laughs> oh, her face, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I mean, it's a little bit of a sticky situation, right? Because they were trying their best to avoid having this personal relationship inside of the larger, in quotes, business, family business sort of type arrangement. Uh, so I tell you, I'm a little nervous for what's going to happen in the aftermath of this because I can see Devon being able to compartmentalize it as just, you know, this is getting business done. <laughs> this is a, a means to an end. And sure, I'm going to enjoy it, but I mean, I'm going to enjoy it in the moment and then I'm going to be able to move on. But I, the look on Hillary's face when he suggested it, she was taken back and then she was taken in front and then she was taken probably all over that hotel room. I mean, you got to do it a couple times just to make sure it took, right? <laughs> I'm dying! <laughs> oh. I'm very excited, obviously. I don't know if you guys are or not, but I thought that would be a really good place uh, to put a poll in it for the week. Are you rooting for a Hillary Devon baby? Are you hoping that this does the trick? Why are chat? Dot com. I want to see your votes. I want to read your comments. I am imagining that Hillary should maybe sort of hope that it doesn't take on the first try. I'm imagining that Hillary should maybe start skipping out on all of her artificial insemination appointments from now on. Gee, I just can't seem to get pregnant. I guess we'll have to keep trying, you know, the old fashioned way. Jack shows up drunk at the ranch, walks right in, the door is wide open, and he sees Victor lying unconscious on the floor. The whole place is wrecked. Jack acknowledges that something terrible is going on here, yet <laughs> instead of calling for help as his first instinct, he just decides to ransack the place. He decides to just take the opportunity. Why not? That's probably what Victor would do to him, right? If the roles were reversed. So Jack has this moment where he makes a decision to just step right right over Victor's body. He kind of recreates that famous hand kick moment. Do you remember this from uh, the 90s? I think it had to have been in the mid 90s where Jack and Victor were arguing in Victor's office and all of a sudden Jack, or excuse me, Victor just has a heart attack and he drops onto the floor and Jack has this moment where he thinks about maybe helping Victor, calling for help, but instead he just walks out the door and by accident, Peter Bergman kicked uh, Eric Braden's hand on his way out the door and it added this element of just pure cold bloodedness to what was happening in the scene, but it, it was pure accident by the actor and it just went on to become this incredible, incredible moment. And here I could see that YNR was maybe deliberately trying to recreate a little bit of that moment. I wonder if you guys uh, noticed that too. Jack 
walks right over Victor's body, goes on up the stairs to the office. He looks around, sees that there was a struggle, and he zeroes in on this external hard drive that Victor has sitting on his desk, uh, and, and he decides to just take it. He shoves it into his coat, walks, grabs a couple of other papers here and there, but then walks <laughs> right down the stairs, uh, goes right over Victor's body again, just walks right over to get out the door, gets as far as the porch, and then decides, maybe this isn't such a good idea. Maybe he should do the right thing. So he does call for help. Victor is transported to the hospital. He's in a coma. He's in critical condition. All of his family is gathered around. They're worried about him. All of his former ex-wives are present, including Nikki there, Ashley's there, and Julia Newman. Here's one of our faces uh, coming back for the 45th anniversary of the show. We see Julia Newman coming to the, the hospital. Now, I was not watching then. I started watching the show in 1993, so I really only know anything I know about Julia and Victor is purely just through research. But uh, I thought that Julia seemed like a very lovely lady. I know that she was married to Victor at the time when he came on to the show, and I get the feeling that Victor was the evil one in that couple. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Victor held a guy hostage and fed him a rat just because he was jealous of the friendship that the guy had with his wife Julia. So <laughs> I'd say it says a lot about Julia that she would be willing to come and see Victor after all of that water had gone under the bridge. She uh, was also welcomed back with open arms by the Newman family. Nikki was happy to see her. The kids were happy to introduce themselves to her. Uh, so I, I think that probably says that she is, I guess, a, a pretty pretty good person, pretty good character. Um, maybe you guys can share some of your memories of Julia Newman. I'd love to hear it. Um, she heard about Victor's assault, of course, because it's all over the news. Everybody's reporting on it, including Hillary. Uh, Paul is all over the case trying to figure out who would want Victor dead? I mean, it's a long list <laughs> of people. Uh, but the problem is there are no witnesses. There are no fingerprints. The staff at the ranch was gone for the night, and Nikki was indisposed. <laughs> Nikki was unavailable. She was not around exactly when all of this was going down. Nikki did have to have a private conversation with Paul as he was questioning her and she had to admit where she was. She had to have an alibi. So she told Paul, she didn't want to, but she told Paul that she was with Arturo when Victor was attacked. Paul was a little stunned. <laughs> And I couldn't help but think he was silently judging her. Like he didn't see he didn't say anything overtly like, oh Nikki. But he was on the inside definitely judging her. He probably went home that night and got into his little silk pajamas next to Christine in the bed, and they probably sat there and gossiped about it all night. Paul had already interviewed Arturo, and Arturo told him about the argument that happened between Victor and Jack at the ranch just a couple days prior that Arturo had to pe peel Jack off of Victor. Now, none of this is consistent with Jack's version of the story. Jack is telling the police when they arrive that he was only out there at the ranch because he wanted to apologize to Victor. They had had a that no big deal and he was just coming there to be the bigger man and apologize to Victor well it's something stinks in that whole story of course and then Paul checks 
Victor's voicemail and he hears that voicemail that Ashley left at the end of last week's show warning Victor that Jack was on the way to the ranch and that he was drunk and that he was angry. So there you go. There is a motive. It's enough suspicion that Paul was able to get a search warrant for the Abbott mansion and he heads over to Jack's house, goes through his things, somehow immediately lands right on that external hard drive that Jack lifted from Victor's house. How on earth did Paul know what he was looking for? How did he even know where to find it? I thought that was a little surprising. Is there anything more to that? It just seemed odd that he would have thought to look for that. It was the one thing that Paul pulled out of the house. Almost seems like he was tipped off or something, but it does establish Jack's motive. So Paul arrests Jack tosses him in jail in his suit. <laughs> Uh, and that's where Jack is sitting awaiting trial right this very moment. I loved, loved, loved how defensive of Jack Gloria was. That was one of my favorite parts of the entire week. Just seeing Gloria sitting there with Michael, who is Jack's attorney, and Gloria, she's just, she's so ready to defend Jack. It just, she's just tirelessly supportive of this man. And I find that just so charming the way she adores him and the way she's so committed to him. And she did mention that they had rekindled their little private relationship together. So I, I just, I was so happy to hear that, see that. And maybe, who knows, maybe Gloria will find a way to help prove Jack's innocence. Somebody's got to do it. So what information was on that external hard drive that Jack stole from Victor's house. Was it secret Newman Enterprises plans to take over the world? No. <laughs> it was just some emails, but there were some emails between Victor and Jack's son, Kyle. Apparently, Victor and Kyle were planning a takedown of Jack all along. We saw a little screen cap of their email correspondence with one another and there was a, a line or a, that Kyle had top, typed out saying, Dad won't know what hit him. So what were they planning? What were Victor and Kyle planning? And furthermore, what could have gone so wrong between Jack and Kyle that Kyle would seek to actively hurt his father and just in such a vicious and specific manner. Um, we got our first glimpse of this sexy little weasel Kyle this week. I, he even pays a visit to Jack in jail just to watch him squirm. It was kind of delicious and I'm kind of all in on new Kyle. I'm just going to lay it out there right flat. I love this guy. I like this actor, this this whole vibe of this character is giving me like Adam. <laughs> it just feels like, a, you know I love a bad boy. You know I love a sexy bad boy. And Kyle is giving me Adam and Ricky all rolled into one. I just think it's excellent. I think there's so, so, so much potential here. I love the way the actor had that evil, smug little smirk on his face as he was kind of trying to bait Jack, kind of trying to rub things in Jack's face. It was perfect casting for Jack's rich brat of a son, right down to the fact that he was wearing those expensive loafers, that three-piece suit, and he was snake charming every woman who crossed his path in just the few scenes that we saw him. Ooh! 
mm, it's gonna be so good for the drama so good to see the dynamics of this father-son relationship I mean every father on the show has to have the 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 jilted son who wants revenge I mean Victor's had it Paul's it, Paul, ha, Paul's had it and now it's Jack's turn I think this guy is gonna be great to move forward the drama of the show and I just think he's real easy to look at too like he's I just think we're I think we're gonna enjoy him I really do and I'm sure there's gonna be some Genoa City ladies who will be enjoying him too oh who will be the first Genoa City resident to charm the snake so what was JT doing while Jack was rotting away in jail for the crime that he committed oh JT goes back home like nothing happened he's sipping champagne having a toast celebrating his engagement with Victoria while someone else is taking the blame taking the responsibility for something that he did and Victoria notices nothing she notices nothing the, JT has just come from this incredible argument. He's just come from knocking her father down the stairs and leaving him for dead. And she notices nothing but a little tiny scratch that he has on his face, which we know came from Victor, but which she immediately assumes that she did to him. She says, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I must have done that to you in the argument. And he just lets her think it. Isn't that interesting? On top of everything, isn't that moment interesting? Well, before JT left Victor for dead, he grabbed Victor's tablet, which had all of the security footage on it, everything that happened um, inside of the, uh, the safe, also the security footage that Victor had uh, being, was surveilling of Victoria's house. So all of the evidence against JT is on this tablet. He also grabs the envelope of evidence that Victor had planted inside of that chessboard last week uh, and JT thinks that this is real evidence he goes to Paul and hands it right over well of course it's fake it, obviously it's fake JT you thought for a moment that Victor was just gonna give you some evidence against him when he obviously knew that you were spying on him all along before and, and, and certainly before you ever showed up at the ranch it was an obvious setup he told you it was a setup and you thought that those documents were real You've been had. You've been had, JT. Admit it to yourself. Victor had you. Now Paul knows it, or he thinks that you did this. There's no job at the GCPD. There's, there's nothing good left. You did this all to yourself. You're done. And you're so terrified that people are going to see you as a loser. Why don't you stop acting like a loser? It is really hard <laughs> increasingly hard to drum up sympathy for him even though I want so badly to have some sort of crumb of something that I can hold on to to drum up some sympathy for him he shows up at the reunion the big walnut grove centennial bash which was supposed to kind of tie in with this 45th anniversary of of YNR um, it was at top of the tower for one thing i was kind of expecting this whole celebration to be a new set i was imagining it would just be in like the high school gym or something something some other different kind of event space and i was also expecting there to be more people i thought that this centennial reunion was gonna like everybody was gonna be there i literally thought it was going to be a who's who everyone's gonna be in, dressed up the newmans the abbots like everybody's probably attended this school or had a kid that attended this school but it was not even that many familiar faces pretty much all we got were a, like a couple regs and then people from the past who were connected to jt raul and Brittany looked 
great. I mean, I really loved seeing Raul and Brittany. I mean, I, I loved them both at the time when they were on the show. I loved them this week. Like, it was a blast from the past that was right up my alley. Raul and Brittany are 1999. That's like prime alley uh, YNR watching and, and soaking in time. Like, I really, really, I got those characters. I connected to those characters. So that was fun for me to see. I just thought there would be some more people. I mean, both of them looked really good. They aged really well. I thought I was a little bit um, taken with Raul. Like he was cute when he was a kid, but like he was kind of super sexy this week. And am I the only one? I wanted to see him full time. He was giving me laid back, like kind of a Nick vibe in a way, just laid back, super sexy kind of guy. I just want to see him more. Raul. <laughs> I want more Raul in my life. It, it's, it drives me nuts. <laughs> it's always driving me nuts that they call him Raul. Why is it so hard to say Raul? Why? <laughs> a Midwestern thing. We just are incapable of saying Raul. We got Raul. <laughs> Sorry, it drives me nuts. And it's just specifically the way Brittany always says it too, but I really liked her. She was really saucy. The way she was holding on to her first stole just said it all. That was, it was Brittany's essence. She was really giving me Brittany's essence, purely just standing there with her little stole. She was a, a former singer slash stripper. I mean, she was a, 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 a fun character. You might say she was electrifying. <laughs> Uh, this being a callback to the fact that she was burned, like there was an electrical issue with the stripper pole at a strip club where she was performing, who, by the way, I, it was owned by a man named Bobby, and I believe he was in partnership on this strip club with Nikki, so there's a, 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 there was a connection in there, but she got burned on the face, and she had this horrible scarring, which was not played into the makeup at all uh, that, that we saw last week. I didn't see any kind of hint of that so um YNR was definitely just bringing her back in her original glory uh they uh, uh, the big surprise for them was that Brittany and Raul are married now and they're super successful lawyers I just I, maybe I'm the only one who loved that as much as I did but I think they'd be a really fun couple to bring on more regularly especially since <laughs> Their, their super success seemed to make JT squirm a little. Mackenzie shows up at the party. I have to, it's, it's an elephant in the room for me. Um, I have to say this actress is not my favorite Mackenzie. There were a few different people who played that role. Even, even the most recent actress who played the role, uh, Clementine Ford, I think was a little bit closer to what I was expecting for Mackenzie. So this particular actress uh, to bring back for Mac was not my favorite. She just always came off as wrong cast to me. Nothing against her specifically. It just feels like maybe she, I've always felt it's sort of in the same way that I've always felt that Melissa Ordway isn't the best Abby. Um, I just think that this actress is too mousy for Mac. <laughs> she, Mackenzie is the granddaughter of Catherine Chancellor. I don't even think that was mentioned at all with her coming back to give newer viewers maybe a little bit of a context of who she is. I don't even think Catherine uh, was mentioned by her. And I don't even know why she didn't inherit inherit all of Catherine's billions instead of Devon. I don't even know if that was ever addressed, but anywho, with Billy's encouragement, Mac uh, tries to warn Victoria against marrying JT. The news of their engagement is little by little leaking out to Victoria's friends and family, and everybody but her can see that it's a bad idea. Mackenzie does open up to Victoria privately there just with Billy and tells her that things with JT may start out okay, but they have a tendency to unravel. He's not showing you the entirety of who he is. Little does Mackenzie know that he actually is, 
but Mackenzie reveals that things happened along the course of their relationship and specifically in the past few years of their marriage that changed him. He just kept losing. He just lost jobs and this and that were constantly going wrong in his life and he began to take it out on Mackenzie. He began to become emotionally abusive toward her. Her words. Emotionally abusive. And Victoria tried very hard not to let that land. I think she tried very hard to not hear those words, emotionally abusive. Uh, but how could you not hear it? You know, I mean, how could you not relate that to the physically abusive situation that you've just come off of? Um, she played it off in front of Mac and Billy, but when she got home, she and JT were having a conversation and he was insisting that Victoria tell him everything that Mac had said. He wants to just know, he just needs to know what he's up against, so just tell me everything Mac said about me. And Victoria told him. She said you were emotionally abusive toward her. And his reaction was so indignant. It was so dismissive. Well, um, she said I was emotionally abusive. What does that even mean? Does that even exist? Yeah. Yeah, JT, I do think it exists, Victoria says. And JT oh, says, oh, don't tell me that she got to you. She, don't tell me she got in your head. Are, are you talking about and thinking about that fight that we had? That fight where I hit the wall? Not that fight where I choked you. That was not mentioned. It was where I hit the wall. He's just selectively choosing what pieces he's going to remember and reinforce with Victoria in the continued manipulation of her. That fight where I hit the wall, well, you were out of control. I lost my temper, but you, you said some ugly things and you slapped me. Doesn't that make you as much of an abuser? I had a couple people, by the way, uh, comment last week that they also noticed that Victoria did not slap JT. Um, that just simply did not happen. This is just the manipulation. So, um, I mean, the fact that he's picking and choosing the information he wants her to hear and spinning it, taking that spotlight, pointing it right back on her, and, and that he would go so far as to say, you slapped me, false, does that make you an abuser? Actually, Victoria, you're the abuser because you slapped me. Now stop questioning me and let's go have sex. Okay. It's just getting worse. It's just getting worse with JT. None of this is really new. I mean, last week was the worst of it. This is just, this is just a continuation of more of what we saw. He had this talk with Tracy at the party after she gave a huh, very emotional speech about Colleen. There was a scholarship that was being dedicated uh, in Colleen's honor and Tracy spoke to the crowd about that, spoke about Colleen. We know that Colleen is near and dear forever to JT's heart. It seemed to be the one thing that reached him a little bit. It's the only thing that's really breaking through this barrier. And um, he sits down and has a follow-up conversation with Tracy. And it, 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 she was so open and so moved by him that it almost seemed like she would be the perfect person to draw a confession out of him. And it almost seemed like he wanted to. I got the sense in that brief little tiny window of a moment that JT wanted to unburden himself. And maybe he will. It was almost, uh, uh, it was almost a moment of humanity. I really wish YNR could expand on that somehow. If, if Tracy is someone that he is willing to talk to, then let him talk. Let's get JT's, let's get what's going on in his mind. I need something from him. I'm afraid that we have only begun to see 
the depths of which he is capable of sinking. On Thursday and Friday's episode, Victor woke up from his coma. He's starting to flutter his eyes. He was able to utter one single word, Victoria. And then he passes back out and goes back into his coma. When, when Victoria heard this, that her father woke up for just a split second and was asking for her, she felt guilty that, you know, thinking that her father needed her and she wasn't there. Of course, we know that's not at all what it was about. Victor was wanting to warn her about JT, and JT, unfortunately, also heard this story too. He knows that Victor woke up. He knows that Victor was asking for Victoria. He knows what Victor wants to tell Victoria. JT's world is crumbling. Every day, every single moment, it's just crumbling faster and faster. There's no job with the GCPD. There's possibly no kids with Mac. He's going to lose them. He really only has one thing left to lose, and that's Victoria. Not only is she someone he can use and abuse, she's his meal ticket, she's his job, she's his center of his world right now, and all it's going to take for him to lose the one thing that he has left is Victor waking up? <laughs> desperate men do desperate things. I wish that Victor had a few security guards that were standing watch outside of his hospital room, but I haven't seen any. Next week, we may very well see JT come back and try to finish the job. This is such a, a, a nothing little observation, but I just kept thinking during uh, the, the Walnut Grove Centennial Reunion Party that Phyllis was there with Billy as her date. It, it, like, in my mind, I mean, this is all continuity and sore as, and it makes absolutely no difference, but I'm thinking about how Phyllis had a baby. She had a failed sham marriage. She had already dropped a dead oct octopus in somebody's bed while all of these kids, Raul and Billy and Mac and JT, were still in high school. <laughs> it was kind of the same for Victoria, too. Like, Victoria's there floating among the walnut Grove alumni, former wife to Billy when she had already had marriages and miscarriages while he was still in diapers. Ashley doesn't miss a beat before she shows up in Victor's hospital room, not so much to wish him well, but to let Victoria know that she's going to be taking over the big chair at Newman Enterprises. Well, I have to give Victoria credit because she is having one of the most intensely emotional times of her life right now. Abused, engaged, her father is in the hospital in critical condition and she just decides to march right back into that company, right back into that office and tell Ashley what demotion. Victor never had any papers drawn up declaring that I was demoted, so I guess it's just your word against mine. A Newman versus an Abbott inside of a Newman company. Hmm, I wonder who the board will side with. I thought that was great. Way to go, Victoria. It was a nice little twist, a nice little power play. Victoria asks Nikki to stay quiet about the fact that Nikki knew Victoria was being demoted, so no one's the wiser. I have no idea how long Victor's going to be in a coma, uh, and so therefore I don't know how long Victoria is going to be able to pull this off because Victor is either going to be really, really mad at her when he wakes up, or there's also a possibility that he's going to have kind of a second lease on life, and given what's happened to him, given what's happened to Victoria, what she's go gone through already and will be going through with JT, uh, I suppose there is a potential that this will leave Ashley out of a job. Uh, although, <laughs> Ashley may just have been given a brand new weapon if she decides to pick up on this war with Jack. 
Abby has spent all week chasing Dina's faded memories. Um, she confides in Ashley about Dina's claim that John Abbott is not really Jack's father, and Ashley quickly dismisses it. She immediately says, no, it's just forget about it, honey. It's just the Alzheimer's talking. I don't think we can put any weight behind it. Uh, Ashley even discourages Jack from talking to Dina when he gets home, knowing that Dina's been saying all of these things, Ashley tries to protect Jack by saying, maybe you should just not, don't disturb mother right now. I don't think you need to go. She didn't want him to hear that. And I was surprised by that, um, that she was protecting him in that way. But I was pleased that at least in this instance, she had decided to kind of take the high road. Um, the next day, though, Dina still can't let it go, and Abby is really, she's moving forward with this. She senses that there's something very genuine about the way Dina's talking, and she wants to get to the bottom of it. Uh, Dina brings down this old memory box, like a hat box, with all of these little trinkets and things that she's kept over a lifetime. Does everybody have one of those? I do. I have like a little, a little, uh, cr uh, a uh, chest of little memory things, little things. You go through them and it's like, oh, I remember that. Um, and Dina has that as well. She, inside of this box, has a key that she's kept that goes to a hotel room uh, where she and Jack's father used to have their tryst. And Abby is able to go online and determine that this hotel did exist it, it, it still does exist under a new name, and Dina insists that they go on a trip there. So they drive to this hotel. They even walk right up to the door, uh, although the key no longer works. I mean, I would hope that they would change the locks after 50 years. <laughs> but Dina's standing there in the hallway outside of this room, and she's just desperate to remember Jack's father's real name. She's trying to find this man's real name because she remembers the love affair so very clearly. She just can't remember the, the man's name and she's standing there outside of the door weeping, just weeping, saying that she wishes she would have built her life with him, not with John. And that every time she looks at their son Jack, she sees him. Oh, it was such a sad moment. Such a sad moment, and we, we just don't, don't really know what to believe. Abby goes home and tells Ashley what just happened. All of this, that Dina's not letting it go, and that she just has a feeling there's something more to it. Ashley's still not convinced. I gotta give Ashley credit for this. She is just really, she's not latching on immediately. She needs to be convinced. They end up talking to Jill. Um, Jill uh, w was Catherine's confidant, and Catherine was friends with Dina at around this time, so they think, hey, maybe Jill can give us some more information to, you know, fill in the blanks of, of Dina's life. Uh, and Jill is able to corroborate the general idea that Dino <laughs> was stepping out on John, like, oh yeah, there was rumors. Dina was floozy and around, no doubt about it, but Jill did not know so much uh, who Dina was stepping out with. So they might as well do the next best thing. Ashley and Abby decide to give Jack a DNA test. I mean, hey, it's been two, two weeks, <laughs> I think, since we've had a DNA test. So hey, I heard there was a BOCO sale at the DNA test lab. And since Nick and Sharon were able to peel themselves off of each other uh, from their hot and heavy makeout session, maybe Nick can hand over that BOGO coupon that he got when he had his paternity DNA test two weeks ago to Ashley and they can get a little bit of a discount. Ah. <laughs> uh. It's a rush job, this DNA test. My only point of confusion over the whole thing, and maybe this was addressed, I, it's, po it's entirely possible that I missed it, and I'm sorry if I did, but so Abby and Ashley collected samples of Jack's to provide to the lab, but what was the lab comparing it against? 
This I don't know. So maybe you guys can leave me a comment and let, and let me know. And I'm sorry for anybody who um, who's counting on me to recap that because I just I don't know. I don't know if it was addressed or not. But at the end of Friday's show, very very quickly, the results are in. Uh, Ashley gets a notification on her phone. She opens up the um, the the results, and we see them receiving them receiving the results. And I know no spoilers at all. Oh, but from the looks on. Abby and Ashley's face. I have a feeling that Jack might be getting a new daddy. Uh, Lori and Leslie Brooks return to Genoa City. Uh, the, the members of the original family of YNR. Um, I think that must have been very exciting for the many, many, many of you who watched the show from the very beginning. Um, Lori and Leslie were in town for this Walnut Grove Centennial Party, but then they didn't go to the party? I, did, I didn't see them there. Did you guys see Lori and Leslie at all at top of the tower? I, I didn't. We saw them at the club beforehand. They were hiding behind these two giant menus, cackling about Genoa City's biggest former hussy. <laughs> Jill. It's kind of interesting that Jill's here kind of commenting on Dina and her, her floozy and around when Jill was a pretty big h h hussy here too. <laughs> um, well, here's I, where I feel like I might be letting you down, Chatters, because again, I only started watching in 1993, so most of this history with uh, Lori and Leslie and Jill and the stories they told, I don't have first-hand experience with. Um, everything I know is, again, just pretty much from research and, and knowing the history of the show, but I do think it was interesting that the story Lori and Leslie told about Jill marrying their father was prior to Jess Walton taking on the role of Jill. I believe that's correct. I believe that the story that we were told uh, would have been occurring while Brenda Dixon was still playing the role. So I, 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 I'm sure that there's still uh, plenty of you guys out there who look at Jess Walton and, and think that she's the new Jill. <laughs> She's probably been playing this, how long has she been playing this role? Probably 35 years, and I'm sure there's plenty of you that are, remember the original Jill and just still think of Jess as, as the recast, uh, not the original. But I thought it was interesting that they were recounting a complicated uh, love triangle uh, to someone who was new, in quotes, to the role. Um... Uh, you know, I've said this before when we talk about the Brooks sisters. I remember Lori best of all because she made some appearances on the show in the early aughts. She had some run-ins with Victor and she, she seemed very sassy. She seemed very smart, very strong. I know next to nothing about Leslie though, uh, to be honest with you, except that she's a pianist and she was really rocking those hexagonal iframes. <laughs> Uh, coming back to the show uh, this past week. I mean, they both looked very good. They both seemed to be two sides of the same coin in a way. I get the sense that uh, Lori is more of the siren. She's a little bit more of the aggressive one, whereas Leslie seems like she's maybe more of the sensitive artist. Uh, I, I thought that they did a really good job. It was fun to watch those scenes. It was fun to hear them recalling stories that, you know, even if Jess Walton didn't play them, those two actresses did. So that was a treat for them, I'm sure, and for the fans. I feel very interested in the character of Stuart Brooks. Um, he's someone that, again, I never saw on screen, but he sounds like maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe he was more of a John Abbott type character. Was he more of a stable character? He seemed like he was, um, you know, they, the, the children painted him as being very moral, uh, being very successful. He was the newspaper magnet. Of, of the town. He, he owned the Genoa City Chronicle, I suppose it was. I guess he was the 1970s and 80s version of Hillary. <laughs> 
only with journalistic integrity. I think he's a very, seemed, the actor seemed like a very handsome man, um, and uh, he, he would be someone I think I would be interested to get to know and to watch some old scenes of, and I may very well do that. Uh, and I would be interested to see how his relationship with Jill was at the time. The character of Jill most certainly does have a great rap sheet. I mean, even just since I've been watching, but way back in the day, I mean, come on, stealing a man right from under her own mother? That's pretty juicy. <laughs> that is pretty good. And I loved that they had a tie-in with Billy here. Um, Lori and Leslie had read Jill the Riot Act and made Jill think about her past a little bit. She was recalling some of these decisions that she made and, and you know, these relationships that she had in what seems like a former life. And she was sitting down and talking with Billy in uh, about it. And I love that Billy said, wait a minute, you chastised me for sleeping with my brother's wife. I guess I get my lack of family boundaries from you. <laughs> that was fun. And she's like, takes the napkin and throws it in his face. It was like, it was a cute little moment. Um, I guess my bigger question, and I'm going to toss this out to the chatters, uh, is, is the, the timing of this uh, story that Dina has told about her long lost love affair with the mystery man and then Lori and Leslie coming on the show and, and telling their story, it made me kind of wonder if perhaps Y&R is building to a twist that this Stuart Brooks is really Jack's biological father. Tell me Chatters, is that even possible? Wedding? or funeral. <laughs> that was our quote from last week. Uh, Nick was standing in the living room of, of Sharon's house and he was dressing and Sharon didn't know where he was going so Sharon walked right up to him and said, are you dressing for a wedding or funeral? Uh, it was just kind of a cute funny little moment. That was our quote from last week and 10 of you guessed correctly that it was Sharon who said it. Congratulations Nancy! Anna, Jillian, Consuela, Henry, Jamie, TJ, Rose, Juanita, and Lynn. You guys all got it right. Here's a, here's a quote from this week's show, and it just seemed very appropriate for, for the week. Party down, dude. <laughs> I mean, considering we had our centennial party, party down, dude, seemed like a nice little summary of the week. So if you think you know who said it, you can go to yrchat.com to leave me your guess. And should you get it right, I will give you your shout out on next week's YNR chat. Oh, so many comments. <laughs> Let's waste no more time here. Uh, Rose wanted to weigh in about uh, Hillary, Devon, Lily, and Kane. Rose says, Lily and Kane are ridiculous and infuriating. And on top of that, their plan that we waited all week for was really lame. I'm still not clear on how they can be making claims that Hillary destroyed their family because she didn't share her friend's secret. And to explain their bad behavior this week, they said they saved Devon from having to explain to a child how the mother had slept with both father and son. Okay, you people with no self-awareness. It seems like Sam is the kid who has the extremely complicated explanation coming, and that's not Hillary's fault. Cheyenne says, I would like to personally thank Lily and Kane for their bitter and childish behavior because one of my favorite couples on YNR wouldn't have gotten their steamy baby making scenes from them on Friday. Uh, the actors who play Hillary and Devon still have amazing chemistry. <laughs> well, it's good. That's one thing we can all agree on, or most of us, I think, can agree on anyway. I mean, you can't argue with that lovemaking scene. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Okay, Shelly. Weighing in on Kyle here. Shelly says, so far, one solid Kyle episode later, I gotta say, I kinda like the actor. Not sure where they're going with the character, but I feel the actor did a great job of inserting himself right into YNR as though he'd been playing Kyle all along. Some actors can pull that off, some can't. 
Agreed, Shelley. I'm thinking back on the last couple of actors who've played Kyle. We've had some good ones. I mean, they, they've done a good job of casting Kyle in the past, but there is just something about this new one. You know, I, I like that he's coming back with an intention. It's not just about oh, him being a romantic lead or being there with no real motive or reason. And I think there's a lot still going to be revealed there, but the fact that he's come back to town with a plan makes him very intriguing to me. And the actor has just done a great job. I mean, the little, um, just the tiny little facial expressions that he was given in that scene uh, be between he and Jack in the jail cell, it just, it, it, it's there, it's soapy. All right, it's it, he's he's got a good he's a good soap a complex villain. I think I think we're gonna like him a lot. Uh, Daisy says, I wonder if Kyle and Victor somehow altered Jack's DNA test, making it appear that he's not an Abbott. Uh, Kyle might want to protect the Abbott name by helping Jack see what he's doing to the business and to the family before it's too late. I'm feeling that too. Daisy, I'm thinking maybe Kyle and or Victor had something to do with, with I, well, it either has to be with where Jack is now sitting in jail or possibly with the paternity test. I, I just, I do want to know more about Kyle's motive. Hopefully it's not just going to be something sort of quick and, and unbelievable as far as like, eh, I just sort of hate my dad for sending me away to boarding school. I wish, I want to know that there's more, more, more to the story and maybe we'll get that. Oh, um, last week's poll question. I asked you guys, what is your overall opinion of this JT Victoria domestic abuse storyline? Very, very heavy topic. I got a lot, lot of comments. Um, a lot of you feeling very passionately about, about this, as uh, do I. 91% of you, the majority of you, felt that it's a sad but true story that needs to be told. Um, that's how I voted, and, and I really do agree. I, I think that YNR has done a, a very um, commendable job of addressing this in a way that feels very realistic. So Fee uh, says, I love that the writers are incorporating relevant storylines that the everyday viewer can relate to, either indirectly or directly. Stories about the human condition, stories we can learn from, stories that we can heal from. Yes, Sophie, and I, I like that you say that it's it's really, it's relatable rather directly or indirectly because I've never been in a situation uh, as Victoria finds herself in, but yet I am finding myself relating to it uh, because it's, it is a story about it, the human condition, as you say, and I think that that makes it successful. And the fact that so many people have come out and, and wanted to share their stories and or just wanted to talk about this, uh, I think that is a measure of a success successful story. Tawny says it's sad to watch this story with Victoria and JT, but it's real life circumstances that need awareness. I'm certain that this will wake some people up from the abyss. I love this story. It depicts verbal abuse, mental and physical abuse from both sexes, and the I'm sorry stage that it won't happen again, how the abuser makes the other person feel guilty. It's sad, but I think this will get people to notice. Tony says, yes, stories like this need to be told, but not just as a PSA. Checkbox here, we covered domestic violence, Alzheimer's, same-sex relationships, cougars of cougar affairs, too fast is my vote. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this writer is definitely trying to um, pick topics, you know, like pick, pick topics that can get some conversation going. Um, yeah, and I mean, I can see that argument, though, that too fast. Uh, how about this from Ellen? Ellen says, I think that Victoria is the wrong character for this storyline. She's had many relationships. She has family support. She is empowered at work. I know anyone can be abused. But Victoria looking past all of JT's behavior makes no sense, especially with young children in the house. She would at least uh, be insisting on couples counseling or something sensible like that. Uh, this story would have worked better with a different character, someone more vulnerable and isolated. That's an interesting point because so many people have said that they felt this story uh, has not worked because of JT 
being the uh, protagonist, or I guess it would be antagonist. Um, but uh, but that's interesting that you think uh, Victoria wasn't the right choice. If you guys are podcast listeners, there was a really good podcast that I listened to a couple of months ago called Dirty John, and it was about uh, a um, a woman who was very successful. Like she had, she was making money. She had her own business. Like she had a family that cared about her and loved her, and she uh, found herself in this abusive situation with a man and uh and dr- and prescription drugs were part of it and it j- I I connected with the story possibly because I had already listened to that podcast and 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 I think it's interesting to note that sometimes women can just be so sensible or, or not just women but anyone can be so sensible and so smart in certain areas of their life and then just have this big gap of vulnerability and then sometimes naivete when it comes to relationships or other areas of their life. So um, Dirty John is the name of that podcast if you guys uh, want to listen to that. It is very good. It's very compelling. Uh, Keisha weighing in here uh, uh, with all this debate about J- using JT's character to tell this abuse story. Keisha says, JT was always a good guy. He's one of the few people who had the balls to stand up to Victor Newman. Years ago, when JT and Victoria were going through Reed's custody battle, we learned that Victor tried to bribe the judge. The truth came out and JT was granted full custody. JT is one of those people who stood up to Victor and won. Uh, We also have Skipper Barbie on YouTube, though, um, having the opposite view on JT. Skipper Barbie says, obviously you've all forgotten that JT has always had the backstabbing and jerkish mentality and attitude. JT took full custody of Reed from Victoria without a just cause. He took his son from the mother who loved him. The only stupid thing and out of character thing is that Victoria forgave him and then let him back into her house her life and her bed. Yeah, it's I, I, I see. I like stories where it's like it just kind of depends on who you are and how you view as to how you see the show, and then it gets this conversation going because a lot of people see the character of JT in different ways. I never particularly viewed him as being a bad guy. Um, I agree that he was. I, I wasn't happy with him when he was trying to take Reed away from Victoria. Um, but I guess it's I give him a little bit more leeway because I feel like I watched him grow up and then. And he started becoming a little icky at, right before he left the show and now he's come back and it's like this total other guy. But I can see how the fans you know, feel let down by that in, in both directions. Uh, Lisa says, I hope they don't try to explain away JT's bad behavior by blaming it on a brain tumor or other illness. I think JT can be rehabilitated as a character, but he will have to show that he wants to change and get treatment. Ugh, absolutely. And you know what? If JT's lucky, they'll give him a brain tumor because otherwise, I mean, I don't, I don't know that he's gonna get out of this. It's, it's, it's a, it's a one-way ticket out of, out of Genoa City and never to return if they don't try to do some type of rehabilitation for his character. Ah, oh, T. Nicole says a person who can leave his fiance's father to die and then act normal toward her and give her a grieving family as someone to be, t- no, hold on, let me go uh, A person who can leave her, his fiance's father to die and then act normal toward her and her grieving family is someone to be terrified of and in need of serious help. I fear for Victoria and those close to her. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Beatrice says, I've been told by a battered woman that they would rather have the physical hitting than the verbal abuse because the hitting happens and then it's over. But the verbal abuse is long lasting and it messes with your confidence. And once that's been damaged, it's very hard to get back. Wow. What a point. And that really speaks to where Mac was coming from. Mac didn't experience the physical abuse and it you know and and even just the emotional abuse the mental abuse was enough to tell her i gotta get out of this relationship and never come back and it was enough to to warn victoria that is just that's so interesting they're two different animals right but the fact that he acted like emotional abuse doesn't even exist 
Clark uh, left a comment um, uh, regarding um, last week me digging in to this JT Victoria story, trying to put myself in Victoria's shoes and uh, saying that I just don't know what I would do if I was in an abusive relationship, that I'd probably just kind of curl up in a ball. Uh, and, and Clark says, Allie, I can see the irritation in your eyes. I can tell you would not stand for physical violence. You know, I went back and I did listen to that part of last week's my our chat. I usually don't go back and, and re-listen, but I wanted to make sure that what I said was what I meant. You know, I mean, it's a very, it's a topic that for some reason just really hits me. Um, and I, I, I wanted to make sure that I addressed it in the most appropriate way. The, and the one thing that I regretted saying was that I felt like I might curl up into a ball if that was happening to me. I wish I never would have said that. I wish I could take that back because I'm putting myself in Victoria's shoes and I, I, I don't think that would be my reaction at all. Um, I think, you know, in a way I was trying to come at it from an angle, the only, like, it, it, the only experience I've ever had with any kind of physical violence was in high school and it was a um, a girl who just for some reason didn't like me and was tr and had said that she wanted to like arrange a fight with me she was like arranging for us to go next to, like to the whatever next door to the school and fight after school and I remember feeling like I don't want this like I am so not confrontational at all I don't want to fight this girl I don't know her at all I never had, had even a conversation with her she just decided she didn't like me and she was like wanting to fight me for some reason which is so against my personality and I just was able to to get out of it I've just always kind of been able to work my way out of situations that seem like they might become violent. Um, I had a, another friend and I told her what was going on and the friend went over and kind of brokered peace, I guess, and just said, Allie's cool, what are you doing? <laughs> so, like, that, that, I think, so when I'm saying, I think I'd just curl up in a ball, you know, that that's me relating the only situation that I uh, that I have even come close to someone wanting uh, to hit me or coming close to hitting me. Uh, so I think that that's where I was coming from, and it was like a blip in me explaining myself. Um, I, I definitely, you know, it's it's tough because I think we would all want to say that if we were in Victoria's position, then we would know to get out and we would know to be strong and we would know to fight back or or whatever the many many right things to do are but if if that's true then no one would ever be in that situation i think where YNR has been successful in this storyline is establishing the way that JT created a, an emotional and mental control over her which has frozen her from making the right decisions and physically getting out of the situation so i think it's easy to say you would just like get out but uh, but a lot of people don't, and there are reasons for that. Um, I've been always pretty good at picking up on red flags. Like, I'm usually able to just eliminate the crazies when they start getting crazy. <laughs> um, but I think at the core of, um, of, of a relationship and of a, an abusive relationship has to be some kind of imbalance in the amount of respect, right? Um, it's really, if someone is going to hit you physically or hit you mentally, emotionally, um, and put you down, it's because they're not respecting you. So I think that even though maybe we can, all, we always know mentally don't put up with someone hitting you or hurting you, maybe the thing that we need to take away from this and that everybody can take away from this is that you should surround yourself with people who respect you. If um, if someone doesn't respect you, then they're going to lash out you or try to pull you down or, or whatever it, it may be. But uh, surround yourself always with people who respect you, who make you feel good, um, and who lift you up, not, uh, not tear you down. So I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, uh, also, as a follow-up from last week's chat, Becca says, in, in last week's chat, Allie, you briefly mentioned uh, what the dynamic must be between Amelia Heinley and Thad Luckenville playing this storyline while being married. Well, I actually discovered after reading Amelia's Wikipedia page that the two got divorced last year. I feel like that would make it even more difficult. I can't imagine what the emotions must be like for the actors. Uh, yes, 
I did know that they were divorced, uh, and I'm sorry if I misspoke and, and, and put out there uh, that they were still currently married. I did know that they were divorced, and I'm sorry if I gave anybody the wrong impression about that. They are divorced, and as Becca says, that does add a whole nother layer of complication to what the actors must be feeling when playing this against one another. I mean, a divorce is a relationship that didn't work, and to be playing uh, a relationship that not only is not working, but is resorting to violence must be just incredible for the two actors. Robbie says, from a technical standpoint, I'm enjoying the lighting and the direction for these scenes. The dark lights and the almost shakiness of the camera are really adding to the effect. This reminds me of the Bill Bell days. Bill Bell did the darker lighting and the more serious storylines. If nothing else, I hope this storyline helps someone somewhere recognize what domestic abuse looks like and leads to someone getting the help they need. Absolutely. Here's a great comment from Zuperplex. I never would have thought of this. This is an excellent tie-in with where we are right now. Zuperplex says, during the show's inaugural season, 1973, the primary storyline concerned the raping of a saccharine, sweet, beloved female lead, Chris Brooks, by a stalker. Pretty heavy, heady topic for the time, Zuperplex says. And as a result, addressing disconcerting topics such as Alzheimer's and domestic violence in more of an unvarnished fashion is only a demonstration of the show returning back to its roots. Excellent. Just nailed it. Oh, well, speaking of the centennial <laughs> and the party... Um, I had a, quite a few people say that they were not happy with what we got from the Centennial and for the 45th anniversary celebration. Gary says, what happened to the Brooks sisters? Lori and Leslie said their father, Stuart, was going to have a journalism wing of the school named after him, but we didn't get to see that. They weren't even at the reunion. They just came to say they were going to the reunion and then we were they were never seen again. Uh, this reunion was the worst ever. I did like the logo on the floor and on the wall, but it was just like your everyday, once every three weeks, top of the tower gathering. There was nothing to it. This was a terrible celebration of YNR's 45th. <laughs> I didn't want to be the first one to say it, but it was not exactly fitting of a 45th anniversary celebration. The Whiter did some nice things. As you mentioned, Gary, I noticed that, uh, that flashy little logo on the floor at Top of the Tower, but I was annoyed that it was at Top of the Tower. I liked all of the title cards that we got showing the, uh, you know, the cake, the 45th anniversary cake. That was all very cool, but within the actual story, it was a little disappointing. It didn't seem like as much of a celebration as they were were building up and I would have liked to have seen some more faces from the past. You can't tell me plenty of these people are not still around. I mean there was a plethora of people that they could have chosen from to bring back and and they didn't and then to not show the Brooks sisters at the party is really a bizarre choice. Why were more people not actually at the affair? The whole centennial thing which was supposed to be the centerpiece almost just seems sort of like an afterthought. It was kind of an after party. Also, I just have to say, Gary, you had mentioned that you were trying to tune in for that uh, new episode of Roseanne. I don't know if any of you guys got a chance to see that. I kind of, I, I, I like Roseanne. I like Roseanne Barr. Um, I, I've been a fan of her um, stand-up comedy. I liked the show uh, when it had its original airing and uh, they've rebooted the series recently and uh, Gary you're gonna like it there's a, there's a little twist right in there I've only seen the first half of the episode but there's a little twist in there that you specifically I think are gonna appreciate so maybe you could go to abc.com I'm gonna guess to see that show it um, it, it aired on ABC and I, I kind of think it's an interesting why in our crossover too because it's it's I don't or I don't know it's not a why in our crossover except for um, the fact it's a little bit of a CB Yes, I mean, if you're a fan of the talk, Sarah Gilbert uh, is is on that show as well, and um, yeah, I don't know. I just thought it was good, and I think you you guys might like it. I still have to watch the second half of it. I see, I've seen the first half, and I was very impressed uh, right out of the gate. I, I like it. I like what they're doing. It seems smart. Um, I think you'll like it too. Anna 
says, I am really underwhelmed with the centennial guest list and the fashion. The Baldwin Fishers, first of all, were missing <laughs> and best dressed, Anna says, in this order, Tracy, Phyllis, and Lily. Well, first of all, I do, do think that Tracy looked lovely. My best dress would be Lily. I loved the, the little pink number that she had on, but Phyllis looked real, real sexy too. So, uh, you know, there, there weren't enough people there that I really felt I could get a good best and worst dress going. But I also uh, really like you mentioning the Baldwin Fishers. I was wondering where they were. Michael uh, was, Michael and, like, I was thinking, why are Michael and Lauren not part of this whole 45th anniversary celebration. Why? Why? And then we saw Michael and Lauren at Jack after Jack's uh, arraignment or whatever it was. So they were present in the show this week, but they weren't present in the part of the story where I thought that they would be. And then you have Kevin. Consuela says they should bring Kevin back for the 45th reunion. He had a lot of storylines with some of the characters that they're bringing back, like Brittany Hodges, and he became really good friends with Mackenzie back in the day. Uh, so yes, I agree. Kevin should have been there. I did see him pop up on Days of Our Lives uh, this past week. So he is officially being folded into the show there. So if you are missing your Kevin and wanting to get your Kevin fix, why don't you go ahead and check that out? Uh, I'm not sure how often he's going to be airing or how big of a part it is, but it seems like a significant role, not just a sideline. I think he's, he's really in there strategically, and it'll be interesting to watch that develop. Oh, last but not least, Ambreen says, hey, Allie, there's a poll celebrating the show's 45th anniversary, and I thought you and the other chatters would want to vote. The questions include hottest couple, hottest affair, best villain, etc. I don't know why Kane wasn't even nominated for hottest guy, <laughs> but it's at um, uh, www.youngandtherestless.com. 45.ca. I think you can make your own, though, your own poll better with 10 questions and include things from the past. Uh, past characters, past storylines. I'd love to see those results. Well, I did check out um, that poll. It was a really kind of a cool way they had the poll set up. It had like videos embedded in it and stuff. So it's Young and the Restless 45.ca. Must be something um, specifically for uh, made by uh, maybe Canada or something. I think CA is the Canadian extension. So um, go check that out. Uh, vote in the poll. And I thought that in the past that we should do uh, like a YNR chat awards. Every time there's an award season, I think that we should do like a best actor, uh, best supporting actor. I always think of that, but then like I'd have to go through the nomination process and it's already so much that it, that's going on on the weekly basis. But maybe that's something that I need to implement uh, here. Find some time, like drill out some time and do that for like the YNR chat 10 year anniversary. It's got to be better than, the, than what YNR did for the 45th anniversary, right? Okay, everybody, that's a wrap. <laughs> Whyourchat.com is where you can leave your comments, letter rep, vote in the poll, guess the who said it quote, and chat about the show. Most importantly, I love reading all of your comments. Uh, it's always really engaging, and honestly, the conversation has been even better lately. So uh, it's just, it's good to, to go there and be able to interact or just read what other people are saying about the show throughout the week. I've been posting more there throughout the week, so it's a really good place to go if something strikes you as you're watching the show and you just want to say it or you're thinking about it and see if anybody else is sharing your thoughts. So yrchat.com and come back next week. Um, it's it's Easter. I hope everybody's going to have a little, uh, a little gathering, find some eggs, got some little bunnies <laughs> hopping around on you. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a good week coming up. I'm feeling much more positive about the show in general. I think we've been through some of the darkest points, and hopefully from here on out, we're going to be headed toward the light. So, fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, everybody. I love you, and I'll see you next time. Bye.